All right, giving everyone else a second to get in. Uh, I want to say hi to everyone. Welcome to the September and Sierra webinar. Uh, we'll be exploring the fascinating intersection of AI and empathy. I'm your host, Duan Mahone. I'm a director of product marketing here at NCERA, and I'm excited to host this month's webinar, Balance Innovation, Preserving Empathy and AI Advancement. I know a lot of you may be thinking, AI and empathy, those probably don't mix, more like oil and water. Well, today I've gathered three brilliant minds who are actually gonna prove that mixing these two are more like creating the special sauce for the family recipe, but in the tech world. And I'm going to be honest, I probably should have used AI to help create a better analogy, but hopefully after this, I'll be able to do so. Mm -hmm. I will be diving into the virtual realm to discuss how machines are learning, or at least make us feel like they're learning, and impacting our everyday life, from customer service spots to music selection, or if you ever wonder if Alexa secretly cares about your day, or if Siri are really clever conversationalists, you're in for a treat. Uh, today, we're in great hands. Uh, we have our esteemed panelists made up of NCR's brightest minds. I have Amy Ochoa, the SVP of Strategy, Renee Beard, the VP of Strategy, and Mike Moore, the Senior Director of Marketing Technologies. Uh, they're going to take us on the journey from circuits to algorithms uh, of AI to uncover the secrets of empathy. They're going to be sharing insights, talking about future, and quite possibly shedding light on whether Johnny Five would be an excellent therapist or not and bonus points if you get the movie reference. I wanna do some quick housekeeping. I wanna let everyone know that we are recording the webinar. Uh, you will receive, receive the recording as well as the deck later. Um, and at the end, be sure to um, hit that survey and fill it out, take a minute and tell us how we're doing, where we can improve, um, and what you wanna see in the future. Feel free to ask questions. I love any webinar I'm a part of to be part of a conversation. I will try to get through them in the process, but if not, we'll, we'll definitely go to the end. Now that I got that out of the way, um, leading into this, I was speaking to Amy, we were prepping. I've heard her say numerous times that AI plus empathy equals better experiences. Before we dive deep into that, uh, can we just do a little bit of level setting and see how we got here? Yeah, I love AI, artificial intelligence is such a, uh, a big topic. Um, so I wanted to spend just a little bit of time on a uh, brief history, if you will, of how we got to where we are today. So if you think about it, um, artificial intelligence, the term, was actually coined in the 50s um, after Alan Turing created the imitation game to see if a machine could imitate a human or do better than a human in terms of intelligence. But fast forward to the 80s, we really kind of had the rise of expert systems where we started to see machine learning in neural networks. And then you move into the 90s, and really this was our first glimpse of natural language processing and computer vision or image recognition, if you will. And we're also starting to create the infrastructure to house all this data that we have. Move forward into the 2000s, and we started to find the term big data. It's really where we were taking you know, structured and unstructured data and being able to put it into the cloud um, and with the proliferation of social media networks and all of that data associated with it and mobile phone data, that was the need, you know, to really um, come up with that big data infrastructure, if you will. Move into the 2010s, I like to coin this like as a decade of a digital assistance. This is where we were uh, introduced to Siri and Alexa and IBM's Watson. And then in 2018, a little old company called OpenAI actually launched GPT. Um, so GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. And this really gave rise to the large language models that we're seeing today. And then just 10 months ago, Generative AI was born when, chat, when OpenAI launched ChatGPT, which is really um, based on their initial um, model from 2018, but version 3.5, where they added uh, chat bot functionality to it, and they put it in a web browser, and they gave free access to the world. So if you think about um, how viral ChatGPT went, uh, here's some numbers to keep in mind. For uh, Netflix, it, it took about 41 months for them to get to 1 million viewers. Uh, for Facebook, it took 10 months. 1 million viewers. Uh, Instagram, two and a half months. For ChatGPT, it only took five days. Um, so it has 
it has created this boom that we are now in, in terms of artificial intelligence. Those are some huge numbers. Um, and it really puts us in perspective of the adoption right there. So if adoption is a precursor to how big this will be, um, where are we going to, like, where are we going in the future? Like, what's next? Well, I'd like to uh, point out a couple of kind of uh, brilliant minds in the space. So one is Sundar Pichai. So think about what, what he said here. It's the, probably the most important thing humanity has ever worked on, um, more profound than electricity. Uh, so wrap your minds around uh, what AI is today and what it can do for us. So think about electricity here. Andrew Ng, who was the founder of Google Brain, which is really their artificial intelligence research arm, he said, just like electricity transformed everything almost 100 years ago, AI is going to transform everything in the next several years. So the time really is yesterday for us to wrap our heads around this and how we're going to use this both in our work lives and our personal lives. Yeah. and. I'll add to that that you know artificial intelligence is going to play an increasingly important role in healthcare, um, specifically in like aiding in diagnoses and then the recommendations for treatment based off of those diagnoses. We're also going to expect to see uh, it playing a larger role in drug discovery and then personalized medicine as well. From an educational standpoint, we're already seeing academic changes as a result of AI with new age uh, educational tools, personalized learning platforms, which are really transforming the way that students learn, but also the way that teachers teach. Higher education institutions are already employing AI to sniff out plagiarism, including works that were generated by other AI tools. So we kind of have it tattletelling on itself. Uh, from an arts perspective, we're seeing AI generated content, AI generated music, AI generated literature, and it's only going to become more sophisticated and more prevalent. Uh, it's starting to really raise some serious questions and concerns, not only about the ethics of the use, but the ownership, the royalties, the copyright regulations. And by now we're all pretty familiar with what's taking place in the entertainment industry with the writers and the actors strike. AI is at the center of all of that. So of course this is going to then lead to new laws, new regulations, new legislations that are all centered upon the ethical and legal uses of artificial intelligence across multiple industries. <laughs> Sorry, I had to take a minute to take it in. Uh, you said a lot there. Uh, Renee, um, you mentioned earlier that you wanted to hear from everybody um, and you wanted to put a quick poll on there. Yeah. I do. Are we, do we have it live there in the PowerPoint? Just one second. Okay, guys. Yeah, we definitely want to hear from you guys how you're using AI. We put in marketing today, but it doesn't have to be in marketing. How are you personally using it? We would love to hear from you. Um, what you need to do is um, join, go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com on your mobile device or laptop, whatever. And you're going to enter this code, which I will put in the chat here. I thought it would show up on the screen here. It is. Enter this code. So you're going to go to menti.com and you're going to enter code 736 two zero two zero two and then you can share a few words about how you're using ai today awesome so so while you guys are doing that renee do you want to, to showcase some of the brands that um, that we've been seeing that we've kind of fallen in love with? Sure. Let's scroll on. One sec. Oh, they're showing up on my. You guys are are responding. I I can I, can I talk about the the poll real quick? Yeah, of course. Uh, 
So I'm seeing folks talking about how they're using AI for thought starters, for planning purposes, drafting responses, and refining their writing, um, which is fascinating because, I mean, absolutely, I'm doing all of that. Our folks from our agency, we're, we're definitely integrating um, some of those same uses, and we're, we're going to be touching on, on, on that throughout our presentation here today. Ooh, there's more for music, for general search, to outline presentations. I mean, yeah, the possibilities are endless. We're, you're definitely in the right place here today. Um, so very excited, very excited to see what you guys are doing. This is very cool. Oh, ad optimization. Yes, yes, yes. Um, fantastic. Okay, well, let's head on because we, we have curated a few of our favorite examples of brands using AI today. Um, it was really difficult to call these down because there are no shortage of use cases for how AI is being leveraged across all industries and for just any number of uses, right? Our first use case is Spotify DJ because everybody loves music, so we wanted to start there. Um, Spotify DJ is a blend of Spotify's own personalization technology, which we're all pretty much familiar with. Um, and it gives you a lineup of music recommendations based on what you like, your past listening history, all of that, um, and generative AI through the use of open AI tech, right? Everybody's pulling in the um, open AI API um, and integrating that. We love this because while generative AI typically works by being trained on a series of preset data, which Spotify is definitely tapping into that, they're also layering in this uh, additional human inputs from their music experts and their editors, actual humans, who <laughs> go in and provide their music knowledge to help give the user insightful facts about the music that they love and are listening to, um, specific artists, um, genres of music that they're listening to, some of that history. So it really feeds the machine, we're calling AI the machine, with more context and insights. So they're taking this relevant experience to a hyper-relevant experience. Um, our next, oh, and we have, we have a quick video if you guys wanna watch this, it's, it's fun. And maybe we don't. <laughs> and maybe we don't do that because there's too much of a lag and that's not a great customer user experience. I can definitely speak to that Spotify thing though. It definitely, it definitely works when the DJ is trying to get you to go to the next thing. I've now explained, I can tell you, I was listening to literally just pretty much in Catholic old school and it gave me some recommendations on Florida Georgia Lion and country. And I can say I've been listening to country for the last like, two years now. <laughs> <laughs> I would not I would not have picked that for any of our panels, but um, our our next example is Unilever and I guys they are using it in any way, shape, or form. If we can get to our next slide, yeah. you guys will see that. Um, but they are upping the game beyond, I mean, they're using it for their hiring procedures. Um, they have something called in, intelligence video um, that takes and analyzes prospective candidates, um, uh, their body language, the words that they use, the vocabulary, eye contact, things like that. Uh, they're using it in product development and R&D. Um, one of the uses that we really love that Unilever is, is tapping into is how they are upping their customer service game. They're using GPT um, to augment their customer service experience. So they have something called Alex that is powered by the GPT API and it filters emails in Unilever's Consumer Engagement Center. Uh, it sorts out spam from real messages. And then for those legitimate messages, it recommends responses to the Unilever's human agents. So um, 
I, I kind of wish for things like this, we had something similar. <laughs> um, and although, so the, the CEO says, although, and they call it Alex, Alex is good at what it does. It might lack a bit of personal touch that instead our customer agent um, have in big quantities. So we let the agents decide if they want to respond to the consumer as the AI suggests, or if they want to modify it in some way or present a, a different suggestion altogether, right? So that is very, very unique. Um, and I love how they, they're, they are balancing empathy with the inputs from the AI or the outputs from the AI. Um, our next example is, God, I love this so, I, I love them all. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly fascinated. And I was up, honestly, until two o'clock in the morning last night, looking at even more examples of how brands are using AI. Um, this is Estee Lauder's um, voice-enabled makeup assistant. And it uses a blend of conversation, conversational AI and augmented reality. It's original intent was to help those who might be visually impaired uh, be able to apply their makeup. Um, I also like to think it would be helpful for people like me who still doesn't, I still don't know how to apply eyeshadow. Maybe it could give me some help. Mm -hmm. um, but you kind of see here, yeah. you know, you, um, the AR um, scans your face and um, so it does that first and then you apply your makeup and then it can kind of tell you um, some immediate feedback on how you've applied your makeup. You, it will give you these detailed descriptions on, yeah, your lipstick looks great or it looks like you're missing a little bit on your li lipstick missing right here on the corner. Don't, I don't want to know. So don't tell me right now. <laughs> um, another example is this interactive um, owner manual that Toyota has in the market. So they have basically provided this fully interactive experience. So now you don't have to have the booklet in your glove compartment. You can just literally type into like a chat GPT interface, basically ask the manual, how do I disable the VSC? I wish I could tell you I knew what VSC was. Um, and it will come back and tell you in, you know, with a with a, a, a chat response. Um, and then it will also show you the visuals for, for that. So if you are, you know, you, you learn better by just reading or you learn better through visuals, you, you're covered. Um, Instacart is another brand that's doing some very cool things. They've incorporated chat GPT. I, I'm going to be saying chat. I feel like that's I use that's too much of a buzzword. Maybe we should be have shots every time I say chat GPT. Um, so they're integrating chat GPT tech into their into their app and they plan to use it to help, you know, as a part of the search engine. So anytime someone asks a question in the form of dialogue, so you can ask, um, what are some healthy meal ideas for my picky eaters? Right. So it'll come back with you know, different recommendations based on that. Um, and it'll, or I want to make hummus, what are the ingredients I need? And I'm, you know, it'll, it'll come back with those recommendations and you can quickly add those to your cart. Um, so it's very cool. And I, and I have a video here too, and I don't think we're going to be able to um, get that to play without that lag. So I'm, I, I think we'll be sending this as a follow-up possibly, or maybe I'm over-promising. <laughs> <laughs> if not, it's happening now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the next example is Bard. And I was going to try to take you guys to a live experience here, but just know if you if you have only interacted with chat GPT so far, definitely sign up for Bard and give it a shot. This is Google's um, chat AI. And it is connecting, it's, it has recently with the latest updates, it's connecting with any Google app. Uh, well, a lot of Google apps. I tested out the connection with Gmail and Google Drive and was pleasantly surprised. So I asked it to summarize my emails from a good friend of mine over the last 60 days. And I entered it. It tells me on, you know, th that it's processing the emails, searching for emails from Lynette, 
summarizing the headlines from emails from Lynette, and here are the key takeaways from that. So I also did a use case where I asked it to tell me the coupons or discounts in my email that are about to expire this week. And it came back with a, a list of those expiring coupons. So some very unique uses. I've, I mean, I'm only scratching the surface here, but the very, very fun, very unique uses with, with um, BARD. All right. And those are some great examples. Um, I don't know why, but the one that sticks out to me the most is probably the one that doesn't affect me at all. The makeup one, because I, I just think of going through like Macy's or a big store, and it's basically like having one of those makeup consultants in your pocket to literally do your makeup for you. I just yeah. think that's crazy. Uh, so those are great examples from the marketing side. So I know we we touched on it a little bit from the responses that came through from that poll. Um, I, I want to know from Mike, you'd be the best one to answer this. How is marketing technology going to be? What are, what's what's the call? <laughs> yeah, so if we go way, way back to uh, high school, for me, that was a very long time ago. But one of the things that I learned in my geometry class was that all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. Uh, and similarly, with artificial intelligence, there's, there's a, some of that that we see today. So for example, machine learning is all artificial intelligence, but not all artificial intelligence is machine learning. And what that means is that many of these providers, many of the MarTech players out there have been in this space for years with predictive modeling, product recommendations, preferred messaging channels, optimal delivery times, and so much more. You know, back in the 90s, keyword chatbots, they became really, really prevalent, but that was just the beginning. You know, recent advances in generative AI like ChatGPT go well beyond your traditional keyword-based chatbots. And more and more companies are, gener are using generative AI to create everything from conversational text dialogue, photo restoration, image creation, voice cloning, videos, programming, coding, the list goes on and on and on. And earlier we mentioned the writers and actors strike. You know, it's a very controversial topic that has the, the entertainment industry really scrambling to kind of figure out how to contain and regulate. But what we're seeing in the MarTech space is major companies are embracing these concepts. Um, for example, Salesforce recently held their annual Dreamforce event, and it was all focused on generative AI. Uh, they're looking to make major enhancements to their Einstein engine, as well as to their content builder, journey builder, uh, to include creative and copy, all derived from generative AI. And they're not alone. Microsoft, they introduced us to Copilot in Dynamics 365 marketing earlier this year. Um, it allows marketers to create audience segments from plain text, converts it into a query, pulls your audience together. Uh, it also uh, allows you to further define the inspiration and tone for the content of your messaging, which it then uses to create the copy narrative. Future releases are now promising to see full journey orchestration that's all generated from simple text. You can just slip, simply say that you wanna do a three touch campaign that touches email, SMS, and mobile push, give it the criteria and it will build the whole thing for you. Bloomreach. Uh, they offer MarTech solutions, including a headless CMS, search and merch, as well as real-time omni-channel marketing through their product called Engagement, which is their customer data platform. They recently announced Lumi, which is a real-time conversational commerce generative AI that's capable of having an omni-channel conversation with your customers. It's fully self-aware of where the conversation left off and then picking that conversation up when the customer moves across channels. Uh, it also leverages Bloomreach's other AI features uh, to conversationally include offers, product recommendations, when the customer is actively engaged with Bloomy. Braze is another one. They have a comprehensive customer engagement platform that announced enhancements to their AI offering, which they've labeled Sage. The enhancements include AI content QA that will actually check your messages for their tone, their grammar, their language, as well as a query builder that promises to convert your plain text into powerful reports and dashboards. So 
by integrating these cutting edge artificial intelligence technologies into their platforms, these giants are harnessing the power of AI to revolutionize marketing economy and empowering businesses to achieve unparalleled levels of automation, personalization, and ultimately redefining the future of marketing in this digital age. Uh, I want to take a minute. Thank you for that, Mike. I want to take a minute to shift the conversation to empathy. So uh, we've got great examples, and everything. <laughs> you're really getting excited. Um, we've had great examples, and I'm trying not to see the, the Starnet. Starnet. Do you have another, another movie reference in there? That's the Terminator. Um, how do we not use the human element in interacting with our customers? Like, how do we balance that out? Yeah, I think I want to start with uh, something that, that Tim Cook said to you about this. And he said, I see AI as augmenting the human that we're supposed to um, We really want the best of both worlds here, right? Um, and uh, Mike and I actually were recently at a conference with Bloomreach and CEO Raj Donata said that, think about how humans are going to play, what roles we're going to play in the future with AI if if you think about it in terms of a ball game where we were normally the players and we were doing all the manual things, right? We were on the field making it happen. If the technology now is going to do that for us, then we have to become the coaches and we need to tell the technology what to do. We have to train the technology, train the data, if you will. So we're going to have coaches, uh, we're going to have creators that are going to take this technology and do amazing things with it, like, you know, just like electricity did, right? Uh, and we're also going to have caregivers. Uh, those are going to be the teachers, right? Um, so when I think about empathy in AI, it's being both a coach and a caregiver. Uh, so that, that's how I like to approach it. So Renee, I know you've done a lot of work on the subject of empathy in marketing for NCIRA. So I'd love to hear your opinion on how we approach that. And I would love to share it. <laughs> I I'm a self-proclaimed empathy in AI marketing expert. So <laughs> she was actually an expert, not self-proclaimed. <laughs> um, but yeah, I um, I want to start with kind of explaining the the different types of empathy because usually when we think about empathy, we have kind of a vague notion of what it means. It feels a little warm and fuzzy, kind of this ambiguous thing, but it's a good thing. Uh, if you dig a little deeper though, you can see that there's actually more structure that can help us as marketers identify where we are in this, in the levels of empathy, so we can determine the best path to get us where we want to be, uh, what type of relationship we ultimately want to have with our customers. Um, the first, layer of empathy is what's called cognitive empathy and this is a type of logical empathy where as a brand we know from data points what consumers are thinking and feeling um, and it's probably where we're most comfortable um, it's kind of that first step right then there is an emotional empathy that kind of takes us a step further this is where we walk alongside consumers and we feel alongside them. It's, it's gonna pay off in a minute, I promise. Um, maybe there's there's a little bit of like, what is she talking about? Hang on. Um, then there's compassionate empathy, which is like, it's the, it's the best of both worlds, best of cognitive and emotional coming together um, that layers in this desire for the brand to help and support customers so a little more proactive a little more a little more active in general um, and as we take steps into each of these different types of empathy like we might not be all the way compassionate today and that's fine we don't need to go from zero to a hundred in a, in a in a day it's not going to work that way but let's look at how we take the next best steps um, to get there and recognize that with each step, there is a little more level of investment of time, energy, resources. So let's just be prepared for that, right? It's 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 a choice. We're going to have to make that choice, and we're going to have to um, take take those actions, right? 
the payoff is there though. Um, I do want to go back if we're mo moving on to the next. Um, I do want to go back to Amy's AI timeline because it parallels the the reason we we have to focus on empathy. It parallels this expectation economy that was built by the the rise of AI and the machines, right? Um, tap me again here. Um, <laughs> So in the 2000s, right, the big data, rise of big data, this led to consumers expecting something from us in return for a piece of data. They weren't expecting a lot, right? Maybe just something transactional, a confirmation email that, yes, we got your payment, something like that. Um, so that's where cognitive empathy was kind of playing a role here. And right before this, uh, it was still Mad Men days where consumers were happy with whatever we told them to buy, whenever we told them to buy it. <laughs> um, we, we basically, and this is a quote from Greece, one of my favorite movie musicals, because I'm that kind of girl. Uh, we rule the school, right? We don't, we don't rule the school anymore. Consumers very much do. Um, so this is kind of that example of cognitive empathy. Um, moving into you know the the 2000s consumers um with with the rise of digital assistants and all of you know alexa do this siri tell me that consumers are now expecting this more real-time two-way conversation with us that goes way beyond the mere transactional or triggered touch points right they expect us to demonstrate or at least start stepping into a little more of that emotional empathy layer and then finally today like, guys, I don't know, when I woke up this morning and got out of bed and took some breaths, I kind of expected my environment to come to me with <laughs> all of the things that I would need for the day because, I'm, and I'm exaggerating, but, but consumers are expecting this 360 degree personalized experience where we are taking into account their personal context where they are physically, where they are mentally, what's their mindset, who are they with, what activities are they engaging in, and they expect us to problem solve, not just for the issues they know they have, but for the ones they don't know they have. So this is where compassionate empathy and also mind reading <laughs> and future, uh, what is it, future telling, uh, what's the word? Um, we have to like predict the future. This is where all that comes into play. Um, how do we get there? And that's why we're all here having this conversation. Um, at Ansira, we we have an approach, obviously, um, and we are very excited to share it with you. And we would love, obviously, to talk with you offline um, about how to integrate empathy into um, what you're currently doing or elevate your game things. I'm sure you're already doing some of these things today. Um, but some of the key considerations that, that we look at are one walking a mile in someone's shoes, right? And this is like when you're going into annual planning, when you go into any room or any situation where we're making decisions or you're making decisions about your customers, about consumers, go in um, thinking about them, trying to understand where they are and how they're feeling. All of that, you know, compassionate empathy mindset that we need to have. Um, at Ansira, we use tools like empathy maps, need state frameworks, customer journeys, um, shout out i'm sure everybody has a version of a customer journey um, that but these things help us keep the consumer's needs in mind um, so we so we can walk a mile in their shoes secondly ask ask them what they think right engage consumers in conversations ask their opinions because they like to give them right everybody loves to give to give feedback <laughs> um, anybody who's ever built a presentation knows that right <laughs> Um, consumers want to make that connection with us and when we ask for their opinion it shows that we care 
right? That is a, a, almost like a passive way of showing empathy. I ask for your opinion, I must care about your opinion. Um, the, the next, you know, the third one that we kind of look at is, show me you know me. If I have given you a piece of data, I want you to use it. And for Pete's sake, do not ask me for it again, right? Because that shows me you didn't listen the first time. And it frustrates me. Um, uh, be a sensitivity superhero. This one, I mean, it, it's, there's so much to this, right? Like this is um, very subjective and we do have a process for how we approach it, you know, methodical process, but considering consumers state, their state of mind, their state of being in planning, in helping them anticipate needs before they have them. Um, curate their headlines. I venture to say that all you savvy marketers out there are probably doing a lot of this work today, right? Being able to curate content that is delivered to consumers based on their past um, click behavior, their past open behavior or purchase behavior, right? Um, we are able to make more emotional connections when we serve up and curate those headlines tailored for consumers. And the last one is probably my, like I would die on my sword for this one. How do we use what we do to make consumers' lives better? Um, two ways right off the bat that I can think of that help our consumers are, are well, helping them with useful information. So, you know, for example, if I have a retail store and our parking lot has been torn up from construction, I might want to inform my best customers or maybe all customers um, some alternate parking arrangements, right? If they're coming to visit and then maybe give them a discount to make up for that inconvenience. Um, that makes their life better. And then surprise and delight them. I know we as marketers, we use that a lot. Surprise and delight, it's just a thing. But honestly, it doesn't have to be something that's overthought. It can be a, a fun little wink in copy that makes them smile, right? We're not, it, we don't have to over-engineer. It doesn't always have to be a, a contest or a animation or, you know, something like that. Just something that can make them smile that is that that creates a connection with them Whew, I have talked a lot um, and I am excited to kind of hear what Amy you know how Amy will be presenting our offering um, that we've been working on the empathy intent solution uh, Dewan, are you am I passing back to you oh uh, no it, it's, it's going to go to Amy but I I want to appreciate the, the wrap up there. It yeah. sounded like it's, if I can put the keys of empathy in the one place, it's basic blocking and blocking. Just basically getting back and get to the basics. Yeah. So those are great points on how we should do that. I would like to know, and Amy, I'm sure you're the person to tell me this, how yeah. are we helping clients navigate that world other than just giving them the checklist that Renee pointed out? <laughs> Is there something that we can do to make that better for them? Yeah, we're we're actually really proud to um, we've just launched a new solution called Empathy Intent Solution, um, and it's a strategic consulting offering that we're going to be providing our clients. And if you think about it, like how we infuse that empathy into uh, all of the interactions that you're having within your marketing. So we do a, a four-step process here, and one is like when I said, we need to understand that consumer. We need to walk in the consumer's shoes. So we do that using uh, artificial intelligence and doing sentiment analysis to really understand those, those key points, those key contexts that we can really dive into so that we are being more empathetic in our interactions. Uh, and then we can work with our clients to determine what data they have or maybe what data they need or what signals they need to be listening for uh, to, to, to move forward in that empathy journey. Uh, we map those journeys. Like uh, Renee said, we do a lot of tester journey mapping here. And then we can also help provide um, the prompts that are so important when using generative AI to get the best output um, out of the technology. So really excited to, to launch this um, and excited to see how we can help our clients. 
it's huge. I mean, this has been in the making for a little bit now, so I'm really excited to see this out in the, in the wild. Um, can we talk about what this actually looks like in practice? I sure can. Okay, so this is going to be a, an eye chart, but we'll get there. Um, so this is an example of a use case that's mapped out. Uh, so what we did here, this is a scenario for a pet care e-commerce company. Um, and we took a traditional abandoned cart scenario and we turned it into an empathetic uh, journey. Uh, so in this scenario, Laura, who's our persona, um, had historically been purchasing large dog food uh, through Ecom um, and stopped purchasing about 60 days ago. And then about 30 days ago, started viewing some things online for small dogs. Um, and then today she added a small dog crate to her cart, but she didn't purchase. So if you think about it, um, normally if we do abandon the cart email, we say, oh, you didn't buy the cart. Would you like to buy the cart? Maybe give them a coupon or buy the, buy the crate, sorry. Um, and, and try to get that purchase, try to get them to complete that, uh, that, that cart. So if we look at it from empathy intent, uh, we really take a step back and we start way before that abandoned cart um, starts. So one, we understand the consumer. So we've done our research. We understand the typical uh, things that a dog owner might go through uh, and start to pinpoint what data we may be listening to to determine if we need to, to adjust our marketing. So in this case, you know, she was buying a certain thing and then she stopped and then she started looking at something else. So we can use AI to do predictions to say, oh, something is different here. Um, and then we start to ask her questions, asking what I think is one of our empathy um, factors, right? To understand why, she's, why she did the behavior that she did. Can't assume it. Um, we can have the machine assume it. That's where kind of human, human intervention has to come in. Let's ask. Let's capture that data so that we can make the output even better. And then once we understand that answer, uh, then we can to adjust our marketing um, based on those answers. So Renee, do you wanna go a little bit further into this journey step-by-step? Step? Sure. sure. Can you zoom in for me? Yeah, there we go. My eyes. <laughs> and I'm not wearing glasses because I want to look nice for y'all. Um, <laughs> So Laura, right, we, we learned she had some pretty significant behavior changes and viewing behaviors online. Um, so as Amy mentioned, um, we, we, we went in, we updated the website. So the next time she logged in or visited the site, um, we shared, a, you know, some prompts, some questions for her to try to understand a little bit about my, what might be going on. Through that survey, we learned that her, her baby had passed, um, the one that she had included in her preference center, which of course we all know is probably locked up and super tidy. Um, <laughs> um, so her fur baby had passed. Um, we respond with some, you know, an empathetic message, you know, we're, you know, we're sorry that, you know, we're, our thoughts are with you in this difficult time. Um, and maybe we offer her a free, customized ornament in honor of her dog, Louie, right? So now she has something personal and something memorable that, that we gifted her. Um, and then we later, um, Laura got does get an email a few days later, right? Because we don't want to hit her with that, with that nice gift as, and then hit her again because then that looks like bribery, it looks kind of insensitive. Um, so we wait an appropriate amount of time. We send her another email about um, the grieving process. We link to relevant resources. So she has um, some of that useful information. That's, that's the really helpful information and the helpful conversation that we're having with her. At this stage, we are not selling. We are just helping her. Um, now, at this point, we see the abandoned cart occurs, right? Um, and if you will zoom in to the next part of the journey. There we go. Um, so we see here um, 
she had that abandoned cart. We're going to wait a little bit longer than usual. You know, outside the maybe if we have a six hour time roll, we maybe we wait a couple of days, right? Um, in this case, we sent her a message after seven days. We sent the abandoned cart email with an acknowledgement that, hey, you know, maybe this is for a new pet. Um, and if you are getting a new pet, you may need some of these other items. So, right, we're doing bringing in the product recommendations based on her context and what we know she's already added to her cart. Um, she's she's not still not in the place where she's ready to to convert. Um, so, in another few days, we send her an SMS and we ask her um, if she's looking. We just ask to confirm: Are you looking to add to your family, right, a new fur baby? Um, she tells us that she's looking, right? She's um, so, so we know that she is in that consideration mindset. Um, then the next day, she receives an email asking uh, about that furry friend and you know giving us some more details about that furry friend, curating the product recommendations for small breed dogs because we know that that's those are the types of products she's looking at. Um, and ultimately, from this touch, because this is the journey that we we built, she converts because we want to have a strong finish for you guys today. <laughs> <laughs> but that is very different from, as Amy touched on, you know, just a standard abandoned cart journey, which every I'm sure you can all relate, right? It's it's set up on a specific set of business rules that are very just transactional driven. And this is really multi-layered, multi-dimensional in how we brought it to life. Thanks, Renee. Um, there, can you pop on and you know, I want to talk about the takeaways um, just to have that conversation and we'll open up for any questions. So. Oh, is that for me? They can be for whoever. Yeah, okay. sure, I'll take them. Um, so there's always going to be a need for human touch with AI integrations. Case in point, <laughs> this image that you see there, I use generative AI to produce it. And and when you first look at it, you're like, oh yeah, I mean that's yeah, that's AI. But if you look in it, like the words aren't really words and the images are just still, I don't know, janky, is that a word? <laughs> I use it. Um, so you can see there's, it's lacking that something human touch, right? Um, secondly, we have to continue to think outside the box about our data. What should we be asking? What should we be appending? Um, we really have to do the research and it's it, it kind of like there is a base of, of data attributes that everybody no matter what industry you're in you just need to have these specific data attributes but then by in there are unique data attributes that can help you answer golden questions for for your consumer that's kind of and that's talk to us <laughs> we would love to help you figure that out um Training the AI with better data can create more empathetic experiences. Yes, because AI experience outputs are only as good as the continuous data inputs, prompts, and training that we are um, We also recommend creating and an implementing an empathy checklist, and that means you got to recognize that sounds so easy, right? I know it's not. It means starting with where are you today in delivering on an empathetic experience? Maybe you got to conduct an audit, uh, looking at you know your current customer journeys, and kind of say, okay, the we're we're kind of dipping our toe into some emotional empathy here. Here's one that feels a little more transactional, et cetera, right? So recognize where you are, and then try to outline, okay, where do we think we can make some inroads, right? What are the next? This is not meant to overwhelm but to kind of uh, provide you with a framework that you can take and, and evaluate each new journey, 
um, touch point against, right? Against the specific checklist. Um, and then, yeah, experience is everything. And that that is, that's our jam. Right? Like for us, there's nothing bigger or more important than your customer experience. Thanks for that, Renee. Um, I can honestly say that I'm done in this hour or so. Um, I won't talk about specifics, but I will be letting Spotify do my DJ from here on out. Um, <laughs> I want to open it up to anyone that's on the call here. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot them into the chat and we'll try to respond to them. I mean, Dewan, you look super like I feel like I gotta step my game up because you got that fancy mic. And I'm just like, what? Uh, am I still using my laptop mic that isn't great? Uh, when the pandemic hit, I had podcast dreams. I lasted, I got two episodes in. And then, I was going to ask if you were podcasting. Yeah, <laughs> no, my little girl's gotten, they take up all my time. So there's that. <laughs> uh, I'm not seeing any questions here, uh, which isn't a bad thing. But basically, oh, guys, we love uh, questions. I mean, it, That's what it means that we answered everything during this entire life process that anyone could ever think of, uh, which is a good thing as well. Is there anything in, uh, in that poll that you wanted to touch on, Renee? Anything else that came through while we were uh, while we were chatting? Yeah, let me look back at that. What like, popped up live? Because that ah, is so fun. I'm sorry that that could not show up for you guys. It's a highlight in my day. Um, Oh yeah, I mean there was a lot more a lot of a lot more folks talked about planning and learning about a new industry. Um, yeah, music got bumped up too, so there's a lot. I mean, music is the great uniter, right? So that doesn't surprise me. Um, but I think we're all on the same page. I mean, and the ad optimization uh, in search, yes. Oh my gosh, yes. Because I was just learning about the impact of SEO do, as it relates to AI. I can't tell, like, I'm just now like, that one's like, oh yeah, that's that's a thing. Like, I gotta go figure that out now. <laughs> there, are, there are smarter people at, at, at Ansira that know that already. I'm just one of those laggards on that part. We're all learning this together. I mean, Gen AI has really only been around less than a year, so. We're all in this together and we're learning it as fast as possible, right? 100%. I was on the lower part of that scale. I usually, I literally used ChatGPT last week to create a game for my kid to like do math. And I actually printed out the code for it from HTML and I put it up there and it did it, script by script. And actually, if I asked it five plus five, it gave the right answer and it had a consequence also for the wrong answer. Um, I don't think I would have been able to do that if you had asked me that two years ago. So definitely start moving forward. Um, and can you throw the slides up? I want to do the last bit of housekeeping before we let everyone out of here. Awesome. Uh, I want to let everyone out. Here for our next webinar, the loyalty blueprint, uh, building and redefine and refining a personalized loyalty program that will be on October 25th. Um, you will be able to save your spot through that soon, and you can actually save your spot through this email or through the deck that's going to be sent out. So you'll have a link in there. And if you are curious about more of our thought leadership, um, a lot of them, I believe everyone on this panel has actually written a blog um, and it's been hosted on time, on time on that NCO resources page, as well as you'll be able to see past webinars, um, case studies, and what it could be. And you can go to the next slide for me. If you have any questions about anything, whether it's the offering uh, or anything that we talked about here, feel free to shoot them over to the email or the webinars at interior.com. Um, we'll get those to the appropriate people and make sure that we get back to you. And I want to thank everyone, one that came to, to watch this 
the shenanigans. I felt like it should be over because I learned a lot. Um, and then we our three panelists. I truly appreciate all three of you for hopping on um, and being able to give a little bit of insight on AI and empathy. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, guys. I'm going to your day. Take care, everybody.